Kierkegaard and Religion was presented by Jack Crabtree at the 2007 Summer Institute, entitled Soren Kierkegaard. The copyright for this recording is held by Gutenberg College, Inc., 2007. Gutenberg College is a non-profit organization, and contributions may be made at www.gutenberg.edu. This material may be copied and distributed in whole for non-commercial and educational purposes subject to the inclusion of this introduction. All other rights reserved. Okay, the topic today is Kierkegaard and religion. Um, I, I hope this is not too repetitive. You've picked up a lot already during this week, and so some of the things that I might that I have in my notes here, I might be really brief about because I think you probably have already picked up on it. But there are three stages of life for Kierkegaard. There might even be more if I had read more in his readings. I, I wouldn't hold him to this, but in the in the exposure that I've had to Kierkegaard, he, he talks about three different stages of life, the aesthetic, the ethical, and the religious. Uh, this is probably old hat to you by now, but aesthetic does not mean what it means to our in our idiom. Aesthetic does not pertain to art and beauty and imagination and creativity and stuff like that, the way we use the word aesthetic. Whenever you're reading philosophers, any before the end of the 1800s, uh, when they use the word aesthetic, it means of or pertaining to the senses. It comes from the Greek word aesthetes, which is the, the Greek word for the senses, sensory uh, faculties. So the aesthetic is that which pertains to sense experience. Um, so that, that came out in Tim's play and, and in Tim's comments about the, he, the, the aesthetic way of life is the hedonist way of life where you are seeking to satisfy the senses and that that's what your life is given, given to and how you've defined your life. The ethical is a little harder to define. When I first read Kierkegaard seriously, uh, it sounded to me like for, that Kierkegaard was reserving the ethical for what the Bible would portray as the pharisaical, perhaps, the legalist, the one who lives by ethical rules, and all the trappings that go with that, in the case of the Pharisees, the, the self-deception, the delusion about one's true nature, the hypocrisy, the, the play acting that kind of hides the true nature and all that kind of stuff. That would certainly be included in the ethical for Kierkegaard. And Kierkegaard certainly talks a lot about self-delusion and uh, play acting and following a script and playing to the crowd and being outward in uh, uh, engaging in outward behavior and defining that as spirituality rather than inwardness. So all those themes that are themes in Jesus' critique of Phariseeism are there in Kierkegaard. But I don't think that's all or only or primarily what the ethical way of life is getting at. Somebody could avoid Phariseeism and still make the, not make the mistake, Somebody could avoid Phariseeism and still be given over to the ethical way of life. So what is it? Uh, basically, the ethical stage of life is to, to live in obedience to, the, to certain rules of morality. And the key in understanding the distinction between the ethical and the religious ultimately is how rule-driven the ethical life is. I think what Kierkegaard is thinking, if we put him in his context, uh, a few decades earlier, Immanuel Kant, um, who was one, a lot of his work was devoted to ethics. And Kant identifies the ethical with the universal. That is, what makes something ethical is it, it is universally true for all mankind that one would behave in this way. And he's trying to capture what's this oughtness about? You know, we all have the sense of duty that there's some things that we're just supposed to do. Why do you have to do that? Because. Because you ought to do that. And he's trying to figure out where does that just because oughtness come from? And he decides it's because your reason tells you that this is universally the case that a person in such and such a situation under such and such circumstances universally would rationally act in this particular way. And it's the universality of it 
that translates for him into that sense of oughtness, uh, O-U-G-H-T, right, oughtness, that, that you ought to do it. Uh, that gets picked up by Hegel. So in ethics, the ethical is the universal. That's what Kierkegaard is primarily concerned about, I think, when he makes the distinction between the ethical and the religious. The ethical way of life is the life of living, um, the, living out the universal, doing what anyone ought to do. Whereas he's arguing that true faith, the ultimate stage of life, where a person arrives at relating to God the way God wants you to relate to him, the way God intended you to relate to him, the way you will relate to him if you are a person of faith and a child of God and one who will inherit eternal life. How will you relate to God? Not as mankind universally must live, but as you must live before your creator as an individual. And that then is the religious way of life. It threw me for a long time because as I read the Bible, religion is a dirty word, a negative term, not a positive term. It's clearly a positive term for Kierkegaard. And, and why is it a positive term? Because Abraham is the paradigm of the religious individual. The one who God comes along and says, kill your, your son that I, that I gave you. Kill him. And the first thing, obviously, that would come to mind is, what ought a father to do in relationship to his son? What must every father universally do in relationship to his son? Not kill him. <laughs> That's a universal demand. And yet, God is coming to him as a particular individual and saying, kill him. And so what do you do? Do you go with the ethical? Do you honor the ethical demand that is on you? Or do you go with the religious demand, the direct demand that God is placing on you as an individual in your individual relationship to your creator? And he's arguing that ultimately the person of faith is the one who's made the transition from the ethical way of life to the religious way of life. He's, he's relating directly to God. Well, I'll talk more about this in a second, but his whole concept of mediation then is this, that the, the person of faith does not have their relationship with God mediated by ethics. It's not, it's not God up here, me down here, and God's law in between us. And if I want to relate to God, I relate to him by relating to his law, and that's how I relate to God. The law is not intermediary between me and God. Ultimately, I have an unmediated relationship with God. I, I must honor the God who created me on his terms that are directed at me as an individual, not his, his demands on mankind as a universal. Okay? Hopefully that's clear. Now, that's, what's getting, that's what he's getting at then when he talks about the teleological suspension of the ethical in the context of what Abraham did with Isaac. The teleological suspension of the ethical is that um, Abraham suspended his, his relationship, if you will, to the ethical. It's not abrogated, notice. It's only suspended. But he suspended his, his relationship to the ethical um, in response to this commandment, direct commandment from God. That was higher, that took precedence, that trumped the, the ethical demand on him. So he suspended the ethical demand in order to be obedient to his creator in a direct relationship to the creator. And I'm not exactly sure why Kierkegaard chooses to call it the teleological suspension of the ethical. I, I, maybe, maybe some of you found a clue to that, but I'm assuming that there's this, what he means by that is a purposive suspension of the ethical. He makes a huge distinction, if you, if you recall that passage. There's a difference between a teleological suspension of the ethical, where you are suspending the ethical in order to obey God, versus, how does he put it? You don't, to suspend the ethical in order to disobey God, <laughs> is, that's what we call evil. <laughs> 
I mean, just, you, you, don't, you don't just suspend the ethical just because, just because you feel like it, just because you want to. There has to be a purpose. There has to be a reason, and that reason has to be defined by your relationship with God. You can see how this gets misinterpreted. Um, you know, in, in anywhere from the 1960s on, where cultural relativism takes over and eventually postmodernism takes over, where the idea of, oh, yeah, that Kierkegaard, what a, what a cool dude he is. He thinks that you don't have to be ethical as long as you have, unless, as long as you make up a good reason for it. And that's not what he's saying. I mean, the, the reason that you suspend the ethical is for a higher purpose, not your purpose. The reason you suspend the ethical is because God himself has, has commanded you. So that's his teleological suspension of the ethical. Now, it, it's crucial in a number of different places, not just one, in a number of different places, Kierkegaard is insistent that the religious stage of life subsumes the ethical stage of life. That's what, that's what the, the, inter, the modern interpretation of Kierkegaard just kind of doesn't pay enough attention to. He's not saying that the person of faith will... will will not honor the ethical. He's not saying that at all. It will subsume the ethical. It will be ethical, but it will be more than ethical. It will do that. It will honor that which is universally demanded of all mankind. It won't leave that behind. It doesn't abrogate that. It doesn't negate that. It will incorporate that and live that out and honor that in the way one lives one's life. However, one's relationship with God is not completely and totally exhausted by that. The, the religious way of life will include that and then go more and go beyond that to something else. Well, all that is leads to the question of mediation. Kierkegaard maintains that, your tr that true faith is always an unmediated relationship to God. And where he develops at least where I first came, became acquainted with that was in Fear and Trembling, where he's talking about Abraham's faith was being unmediated. In that case, it's this law, ethical demand, is not mediating Abraham's relationship with God. Abraham has a direct relationship with God rather than um, an indirect relationship with God through, through the mediation of ethics. Where I really understood this quite early in my life, I think, as a as a child, because being born, uh, being born, being raised in the roughly evangelical tradition, or if you will, born again Christianity, it, it seems to me the one thing that born again Christianity really has got right, not that there aren't distortions of uh, around the edges of this, but at the heart of it, what born again Christian. Christianity or the notion of being born again within evangelical Christianity is saying is that there's this decisive break from just going to church and identifying yourself culturally as a Christian and actually being personally, individually committed to your relationship with God. You're having a personal relationship with God. That's what Kierkegaard is talking about. Now, granted, Evangelicals will, won't recognize that that's what Kierkegaard is talking about sometimes because, because there are some significant differences between them. But at the core, it's the same idea. Um, I, I remember having friends who were either Episcopalians or Lutherans or you know, especially higher church uh, people where I, I couldn't relate to their Christianity because their Christianity seemed to be so much about the ritual of their church, the worship of their church, the, uh, the institution of their church. And, and my, my notion that I was an individual before the creator who had to be personally related to the creator seemed alien to them. They didn't, they didn't really know what to do with that. That's what Kierkegaard is talking about. And you can see in his context how radical that would be. And if you're born Danish, you're born Lutheran, you're born Christian, you are christened in the church, you are buried in the church, you are married in the church, you are ordained by the church, uh, you, are, you, you are sanctified. Sorry.
And, and all of that is so easy and effortless and natural and automatic to you that you never had to make any decision. So what Kierkegaard's way of describing that is why is it that you think you are relating to or doing business with God? Well, because you're constantly relating to and doing business with the church. So Kierkegaard would say, well, don't you see? Your relationship with God is being mediated by the church. It's the church that stands in between you and God. And, and you're never doing business directly with God. You're only and always doing business with the church. And then you're calling it doing business with God, relating to God. That's what he means by mediation. And I, I, th I think that's a really, really profound idea. Um, well, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. There are so many different things that can mediate our relationship with God. And Kierkegaard explores some of them. Others, perhaps he doesn't uh, explore because there's just probably an endless supply of possibilities. Uh, religious piety is something that can mediate my relationship with God. So I know that I'm obeying God and serving God and loving God and whatever you want to plug in there, worshiping God. I'm doing my God relationship because I use a certain kind of pious language in my speech or I pray a certain amount or I read my Bible a certain amount or whatever my particular brand of piety is that I have been enculturated into, by doing piety, I'm doing a relationship with God. And Kierkegaard would say, no, well, I mean, okay, but that's not faith, because faith is never mediated. Faith is never, is never practiced by practicing something else, by practicing piety. He's already, we've already mentioned ethics and morality, but ethics and morality is huge for a lot of people. <laughs> That by, by doing ethics, and on some, that, that means for some Christian traditions, social justice issues and world hunger and poverty issues, and by being someone who's fighting world poverty, I'm relating to God. I'm serving God. I'm loving God. On the other, more conservative end, it's by, by opposing homosexual marriage and abortion. I'm loving God. I'm serving God. I'm doing the work of God. And Kierkegaard's problem with all of this is that don't you realize that you could fight social justice on the one hand and oppose homosexual marriage on the other hand and, and have a completely stinking heart? I mean, none of that makes you rightly related to God as an individual creature before his or her creator. None, none of that amounts to the same thing. Not that those things may, in individual lives, result from that kind of relationship. They might. But they can't replace the, the unmediated relationship with God. That's faith. That's spirituality. Um, other people, other individuals, can mediate our relationship with God, especially when you're children. Your parents mediate your relationship with God. Um, However they say, I, whatever they say my status is before God, that's my status before God to the child. That's Christian culture plays that role. Who, whatever the relevant Christian culture is, if I'm a member in good standing of Christian culture, then God is pleased with me. That's to have that Christian culture mediate my relationship with God. Um, the Bible could be that. If I am studying and seeking to understand the Bible and I'm gaining the tools to exegete the Bible and that's just what I'm doing, if I'm doing that instead of relating directly to my creator, then that's mediating my relationship with God. That's not faith. It may be a very important thing to do, but it's not faith. A religious experience can mediate my relationship with God. That's becoming increasingly common, I think, in Christian culture, where most of the church service is spent in what, what we call worship, which I think Kierkegaard would say is an aesthetic experience. It's not a spiritual experience at all. It's an aesthetic experience. It's an outward thing, not an inward thing. 
and we let that mediate our relationship with God. Because I feel like I adore Jesus, I do, in fact, adore Jesus. How do I know I adore Jesus? Because it's being, my relationship to Jesus is being mediated by my experience, by my aesthetic experience. Um, so the, the possibilities are actually endless um, for what, what we could put there as the, the thing that mediates our relationship with God. Jesus is talking about this in Luke 16. Let me, let me just look at this with you for a second. This is verse 15, and I, I'm not going to look at the passage. I just, there's just one comment he makes here that's very telling. Um, now, the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he, Jesus, said to them, you are those who justify yourselves, that my translation has, in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. What he means by that, I think, is the Pharisees are people who decide what their relationship is to God, whether or not they are just in the, guy, in the eyes of God or not just in the eyes of God. They do that by convincing other people that they are just in the eyes of God or not, rather than not just in the eyes of God. And the idea is that they're playing to the crowd, to the religious crowd of Israel, and by convincing that religious crowd that they are religious people, they pat themselves on the back with great satisfaction that all is well between them and God. And notice what he goes on to say. You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. And that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. And the point he's making is you shouldn't be overly impressed by the, the, the religious culture pointing to you and identifying you as a relig religious person because God, who actually knows your heart and men don't, um, I mean, that's one problem. God knows your heart and men don't. The other problem is what the crowd approves of, God often detests. His values are not the same as the values of any given religious culture. So you are on really shaky ground if you're going to assume that your standing in God's eyes can be identified by what, what the people say your standing in God's eyes is. Uh, God's not going to ask the crowd. He's going to look for himself. He's going to judge for himself. So he says, don't, don't be the kind of people who are having your relationship with God mediated by people. That's exactly what Kierkegaard is, is talking about. So what that, what that implies then, and Kierkegaard explores this in a number of different places, is that the person of faith is going to be required by virtue of that faith to be courageously independent of the culture of Christianity around him. He's not going to be enculturated and be a member in good standing of Christian culture. He's always going to be at odds on the margins of, at odds with, and, and a misfit within Christian culture because he's not seeking to please the culture in order to be rightly related with God. He's actually trying to be rightly related with God. And inevitably, Kierkegaard maintains, inevitably, that's going <coughs> to bring him at odds with the culture. Socrates, Jesus, all the people who were seeking as individuals to be rightly related to the infinite, they always end up getting killed. <laughs> or, or ostracized, or mocked, or held in contempt, but in s <laughs> some way hated and despised. They, they were, and that's what Jesus said. If they hated me, if they hated the teacher, of course they're going to hate the students. If you're, if you're seeking to follow what I have taught you, and they hated me, then take it for granted that they're going to hate you. So that, that strong emphasis on, on that inversion, that absurdity that Earl's talked about a couple of times, that absurdity that, that it's the way that everyone, it's when everyone around you says you're on the, right, the wrong track that you're on the right track. 
It's when everyone speaks well of you, watch out. Sounds like, I think Jesus said that, didn't he? I think I'm almost quoting a verse. When everyone speaks well of you, uh, woe to you. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. That's what Kierkegaard is getting at, is there's going to be inevitably a clash between the person of faith and what he calls Christendom, the practices, institutions, and culture that Christ, that people create. Um, okay, so there's... A, let's see. Let me pause there for... Because that, that's the nub of it. I want to make sure that I've answered any, that I've been clear about that, and then we can go on if. Um, what, if, uh, I have a question about Abraham and This is a question about Abraham and how he knew it was God telling him to sacrifice his son. And we've got lots of people who come out, you know, terrorists and stuff, who claim that God told them to blow up you know, fly planes into buildings and that kind of thing. And so what what justifies someone in believing that God wants me to do a teleological suspension of ethics um, in a particular situation? And what is the logic behind, let's say, do, uh, it, I am in fact correct that God is asking me to do this thing. Why isn't that an ends justifies the means kind of a thing? God um, is is what God is asking uh, Abraham to do inconsistent with the ethics. It's it's um, it's true that it's um, it, it sounds funny to ask if it's inconsistent when it seems to violate it. But is there a larger picture of the good that could incorporate yeah. both the ethics and what God is asking Abraham to do? But that's why I brought in the kind of Kantian, Hegelian view of ethics is that it's the universal demand. I would say that by, in the way that he's thinking about ethics, it is in violation of ethics. Is it in violation of goodness? No. That's not the same thing. And that's an, that's an important distinction because eth ethics in and of itself does not capture goodness. Yeah, I, I left that out. Let me, let me comment on that. Uh, it was very helpful. I read an uh, introduction to ethics by a guy named Louis Poyman, an philosopher, American philosopher named Louis Poyman, who I think must be a believer. Um, probably hiding it, but I, I think he must be a believer. Um, and he, he made the distinction between ethics being objective, eth ethical truth. The question is, yeah, ethical truth being objective versus absolute. We Christians are often, we, we often frame the debate. We will often identify ourselves as we are people who believe in ethical absolutes or moral, moral absolutes. Well, actually, that's not true. We don't believe in moral absolutes. What we believe is in, is in moral objectivity. And that's not the same thing. And here's the difference. What, what we believe is that more, the moral structure of the universe is just as real as the physical structure of the universe. You know, you, you drop a book and it falls to the ground because of the laws of, of gravity dictate that that's necessitate that that will be the case or almost necessitate it. It's an approximation that it will fall to the ground. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's just written into the universe that that's the way nature and physics works. It's just written into the universe that good is good and evil is evil. X is good. Why is evil? That's just written into the universe. It's not, if I think it's good, it's good for me. It's not, it's good for me, but it's evil for you. I mean, it just is anybody in my situation in exactly the same shoes that I'm standing in, the same thing would be good no matter what person you put, put there. So it's objectively true that the right thing to do is the right thing to do. The problem is... When you, when you start talking about moral absolutes, or especially if you start talking about ethical absolutes, what is it you were describing? We're actually describing maxims of some kind. Thou shalt not murder, 
uh, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, you know, whatever. And, and we're actually making a description of, of the moral truth and we're making a claim, take this description and I don't care who you are, where you are, this description will be a description of what you ought to do. Well, that's actually false, as Abraham found out. Uh, the, the very same thing that other, under other circumstances would have been murder, under these circumstances was not murder. So that maxim failed him. It didn't guide him morally. It wasn't helpful to him morally to tell him what to do. There was something that transcended that, the voice of God saying, kill your son. And the voice of God telling him, kill his son, made it a good thing for him to do, not an evil thing for him to do. It was the right thing for him to do, not the wrong thing to do. And I would argue, if he hadn't set out to kill Isaac, he would have been immoral and disobedient. So to clarify, <clears throat> the maxim, don't murder, is uh, un implied in there is... Um, it's it's a shorthand that implies certain circumstances, and uh, uh, behind that is the idea that life belongs to God, and it's God's prerogative to determine when somebody lives and so when somebody dies, and it's not my prerogative, and so I should not, under ordinary circumstances, decide, presume, to decide that this person is going to die. But Bingo. because life belongs to God, it is God's prerogative, and if he he tells me this person's going to die and you're going to be the agent of it, then that's not uh, incompatible with the ethics because it's a different circumstance. Exactly. Exactly. Now, are there some ethical principles that are absolute? Uh, maybe. But that's, that's an that's a empirical question. Not a, it's not because we are committed to believing in moral absolutes. Because we're not. I mean... It gets tricky in ethics and morality. How do you describe an event? How you describe an event is going to alter how you look at it morally and ethically. Um, you know, if I described an event of some dude taking a sharp knife and ripping your chest open and grabbing your heart and taking it out, that sounds immoral. But if it's, if it's seeking to give you a heart transplant, it's no longer immoral. I mean, so how you describe the event makes all the difference in the world what the moral truth is about the event. Well, can a maxim take into account all the possible ways in which we can describe actions in our life and the events? Probably not. I mean, we'd have to be God himself to be able to, to come up with those descriptions, and those would be too long for us to read. You know, for them to be accurate enough, they'd be too long for us to, to read. That's what makes a maxim usable, is that it's generally true. You just have to be smart enough to know uh, how you need to adjust it or how you need to qualify it in the right circumstances. So that, that was very helpful to me, to, to recognize the distinction between we, we are moral objectivists, but we are not moral absolutists. Um, then you, the other part of your question was, how did Abraham know? Remember, Abraham had spoke, uh, Abraham, God had spoken to him before. So it's not just out of the blue, this voice shows up saying, murder your kid. <laughs> that this is the same God who promised him the son. This is the same God who called him out of Chaldea. So, so he's learned through experience to recognize the voice of this one and trust the one behind the voice. And now I don't know the particulars of, what the voice sounded like. I think it was Charlton Heston, but uh, I, I don't know the particulars, but obviously, but Abraham, there's no reason to think that Abraham couldn't have known. Um, and, and for us, you know, until we have the experience, I, I don't know that we can know that in advance, how, how we would know that it's God speaking to us. And I think we ought to be critical, think critically about that. Um, God, God will, I think God always trained his prophets to know when it was him appearing to them, when it was him speaking. Because uh, when, when they describe it, 
the word of the Lord came upon me, the oracle of the Lord came upon me, the burden of the Lord came upon me. They, they speak as if it's this identifiable experience that they have learned to recognize. Mm-hmm. So I, I wonder also then, it doesn't necessarily have to be the voice of God somehow. It could be my reason that tells me when, you know, to suspend the ethical. I'm just an example, ready example is many people are very upset when there's a story or something where someone tells a lie, uh, even if it's like to save someone's life, but they told a lie. And that, you should never, ever, ever tell a lie. And I think, I think it was in The Hiding Place where Corey Ten Boom, her sister or someone, wouldn't lie that she was hiding the people, the Jews. And um, even when someone came, and I think there was a miraculous, they didn't hear her say, yes, they're here or something. <laughs> but, well, what happened is the Jews were under the floors, under the table. Yeah. And the, not, the SS asked her, are you hiding Jews? And she said, yes. Where are they? They're under the table. Oh. They looked on the table, there's nothing there, so they thought she was just crazy. So God honored that or something. But but I just, I mean, some people are very, maybe I should be. Should we be, should we just never, ever tell a lie? Or are, are there occasions no, see, that's, where we No, lying is a good example. Um, as a maxim, I mean, I, I think lying is one of the most vicious things a human being can do because it, it hits us at a spot where every human being is very, very vulnerable. We are hardwired to trust one another because we need other experiences and information from others to know reality. We're dependent upon that. So when people play fast and loose with the truth, that's a very vicious thing for, for another human being to do. So, But as bad as lying is, I, I would argue that if we turn the maxim, you shall never lie, as Kant does. Kant is famous for this. He, th- he thinks one should, under absolutely no circumstances, ever not speak the truth. Um, but I think that's an inferior moral position. Because if my moral intuition is that what Tor- Corey Ten Boom's sister did was, was an atrocious thing to do morally. What you would be, now notice the description. One person would describe that, she's telling the truth. Another way of describing it is she be, she's being complicit in the institutional murder of another human being. And she's com- being complicit in that. Well, which way is, which is the better description of the action? I, I think the being complicit in the murder is, is the morally relevant description of what she's doing. I don't honor her for being truthful. I blame her for being such an idiot, a moral idiot in that case. So, so that, there's a good example of a maxim that actually fails. For the most part, it, it captures a very, very important and profound truth. Lying to people is vicious. That's true. But what if they're already being vicious and asking you to be complicit in their viciousness? Yeah, because I was going to ask you for an example of when you would suspend your your ethical position. Yeah. I, I was trying to think, when would I do that? It was actually Ted Wise who, who uh, I once described to me, I mean, help me, uh, help me see this. Um, we, retranslate, when the SS officer knocks on the door and says, are you hiding any Jews? Retranslate his question. Will you help me find and murder Jews? <laughs> to which you answer, no. No, I'm, no. Mm-hmm. I don't know if this was if this was you speaking personally, or if you were trying to explain Kierkegaard uh, in sort of our interaction with Christian culture. Uh, if if I heard you right, and maybe you can clarify, you seem to say if we are truly following God, then we uh, will naturally be in opposition to Christian culture. And maybe it would help for you to clarify what, what, how you would describe Christian culture. And if that's always true, uh, it, it, it takes a very low view of Christian culture. And, and it, it almost sort of, I don't know, excludes us 
um, and, and, and in a sense, we sort of have the right path. I can actually show that I'm doing what's right if I'm in opposition to what everyone else is doing. Do you well, see except, the question? Isn't except it? you would be allowing your opposition to the culture to mediate your faith, to your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. I mean, to conform, to oppose Christian culture just for its own sake would be just as wrong as to, did I say oppose, as to conform to it. Right. Both of them are taking Christian culture too seriously and not taking God seriously enough. But you were describing that if we do sort of truly follow God as an individual, you almost seem to be saying that we will be in opposition to Christian culture. Do you find that to be true? That's definitely Kierkegaard's position. That's definitely my position. And therefore, it's definitely true. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Now, whether it's true or not, you know, but... But notice all those passages where Jesus is warning. Um, yeah, the way is narrow, and so you're going you're gonna to run afoul of everybody else. They really aren't going to like what you stand for and what you are committed to and the path you're following. They're not going to like it. So Christian culture you seem to be defining as Christianity that's not sort of tied up in pursuing God truly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. That helps. Yeah, I'm not saying... Um, well, I, th- there's two things behind it. I do think that cr- any culture that we build as Christians is going to be a combination of our sanctified judgment and our sinfulness. They're just going to be all bound up together. So you're never going to find a cult- culture created by Christians that's just Christian. I mean, that, that is just a culture based on and founded on faith and only faith. There's always going to be elements of it that are uh, that are worldly and and humanly sinful, and so anyone who who recognizes and sees the the effects of sin on the culture and starts pointing at it, what's likely to be the response? Well, human beings being what human beings are, they're likely going to be marginalized and ostracized in in some way. Um, but I'm not saying that culture is not inevitable. It is. I mean, I, I'm a part of a church, Reformation Fellowship, that has its own little microculture. And um, is the gospel at the heart of what we're all about? I hope so. Um, but an outsider could tell, could tell me better than I could see. I mean, I'm probably too close to it. But an outsider could probably look at it and go, boy, this is, pretty, this is a pretty funky aspect of how you guys relate to each other. Um, but it's not that we've avoided cr- uh, Christian culture altogether. We've just built our own. Because being human beings, we are going to build a culture no matter what. So, so I, I, what I mean by, what he means by Christendom is, is your, you've put your finger on it. What he means by Christendom is the, the approach to Christianity in the Danish Lutheran Church that has built its institutions and its culture and so on. But one could conceive of a culture based on a better view and vision of Christianity than that is. But I think the propensity is always going to be, whenever we institutionalize our Christianity, the propensity over time is always going to be for a corrupted view of the faith, not, not the other way. I just want to, a little bit of clarification on the term mediation, or mediator, how, how you're using it here. Because I think of like a, a mediator who sits between two people who are disagreeing or someone in that role. And so is the piety or the church or our opposition to the church being our mediator, is that to say that it's the thing that kind of stands in the way of faith for us that we're un, that that we are misled to believe is um, sanctifying us. For instance, um, one example you gave is like Bible study. If I'm doing if I'm doing Bible study and I'm really getting into Bible study, but I'm not necessarily looking inward. Right. So in that way, I'm letting Bible study mediate my relationship with God because I, I'm using it in such a way as to um, think that it's what's sanctifying me? Yeah, that, that would be, I think that would be, 
I think what he means is it replaces it. But, but the fact of the matter is that what you say is true as well, is that that's the kind of mistake that I'm making, is that I'm instead of taking what I'm reading in the Bible and then considering the implications of that leading to an existential choice, leading to inwardness, I'm just stopping at understanding intellectually what the Bible is saying, and I'm allowing that to stand for rightness in God's eyes, I, or being pleasing in God's eyes, because I know the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Jack, in the footnotes of concluding on scientific postscript, uh, when that word mediated is used, uh, the references to Hegel's German word, where he is using it to describe the coming together of the thesis and the antithesis mm -hmm. that results in a synthesis. Mm -hmm. So could you grab hold of that and then answer that same question and continue to uh, define this notion of mediation? Because it sounds to me a little bit different to me from, from, from what you're saying, but it, I, I might not be understanding you correctly. So uh, run with that for well, a minute if you don't mind. Help me, but what, how does it sound different to you? Uh, that I would take, let's say, Bible study, for example, that I would take my relationship with God an, as a thesis and my, my Bible stu study as an <laughs> antithesis, marry the two together, and out comes what I would call my relationship with God. Okay. So, but maybe that, that is what you're saying. Well, I'm, I'm assuming that what he would have in mind is the thesis and antithesis. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you too. Good. Glad to hear I'm not the only one. That if, if God is the thesis, I am the antithesis. We are the ones that need to relate and come together in a, in a synthesis and a harmony uh -huh. and a, to be reconciled with each other. And what is it, that's, that, is, what is it that we're putting in between that's the, the mediation that is the source of that synthesis? Christendom, Christian culture, the church, other people. So if it's Bible study, it would be that I am seeing in Bible study the place, the locus, where God and I meet. And, and, and what he's saying is, and what, what I'm saying is, um, no, it's not Bible study. Bible study is important. It's yeah. the word of God. It's revelation. It's truth. It, it knows me. It searches me. It finds me out. I mean, it, there's, a, there's a ton of valuable things in the Bible. But none of those are of any account if I don't do, do anything with them. I need to be, so it's an unmediated relationship with God. I just, need, I just need to decide to commit to God. I don't commit to Bible study. I commit to God. And, and the Bible can be a tool in that process, but it doesn't replace God as the one I must be at one with. What is the relationship between the ethical and the night of infinite resignation? Are they synonymous? Are they... No, I don't think so. What, what is the relationship so. then? Or is there a relationship? Um, good question. The, the night of infinite resignation is going beyond the ethical. He's, he's already on the way toward faith because... He's, he's come to a point in his life. See, I, let me back up. Um, I, th I think w the question is, why does he call it infinite resignation? And I think the reason he calls it infinite resignation is he's taking infinite quite literally. Infinite is not finite, and finite literally is bounded, something that has boundaries. So I think he probably has something like the pearl of great price in mind. That pearl was so valuable that there was nothing that he, was, that he would withhold uh, in order to get it. There was nothing that he wouldn't give up. That is, his sacrifice was infinite, unbounded, without boundaries. You know, it's not like he looked at his possessions and drew a line there and said, you can have all that, I'll give all that away for the kingdom of God, but this man, I'm gonna keep. That's not an infinite resignation. An infinite resignation is God, uh, you take whatever you need to take, but I want, the, I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple, whatever the cost. There's no limit on what the cost might be. That's infinite resignation. Well, the, the ethical man is simply trying to relate to the eternal, to God, by doing what is universally demanded of every human being. 
and that, that just living his life ethically. Along comes God and places a not no longer an ethical demand, but la- literally a personal individual demand. I'm going to take your wife. I'm going to take your husband. I'm going to take your child. I'm going to take all your money. I'm going to take your reputation and just rip it away from you. And, and when that's ripped away from us, now we're tested. Were there limits on what I would allow God to take from me in order for me to enter into the kingdom of God? And the night of infinite resignation is able to say, no, no limits, God. I want you enough that um, take what you must. And, and he says in there, you have to pass through that stage in order to get to faith. Uh, and yet it's not faith yet. So I think that's beyond the ethical. I think that's a, 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 on the pathway to faith. Yeah, it's kind of on the, yeah, it's on the transition from the ethical to the religious probably. Quick follow-up question: Can what about infinite resignation? Does it always lead to faith? Always, what did you say? Lead to faith? No, no, I don't okay. think necessarily. Yeah, if you, well, as I understand the distinctive, the the night of faith goes the one step further. Who he says, by virtue of the absurd hopes in um, that which has been given up. So we believe to put it in mundane Bible language, we place our hope in the gospel, we place our trust in God, and our trust is that he will reward me, that I, I'm not committing existential suicide here, but I, in the end, am going to be rewarded for having put no boundaries on, on my resignation. And what, what was not clear, what's not clear to me in the reading is he makes it sound and he makes the, sound, the night of faith sound pretty goofy uh, in that um, he almost makes it sound like you are simultaneously totally and truly willing to live your life without X and you're firmly believing God's going to give X back to you simultaneously and that that's the absurdity. Could be, but, I, but that's not really very biblical. So I, I'm inclined to think that's not what he means. I think what he means is what he's going to get, what you are hoping that he will give back to you is something equally valuable, equally important, equally worth it to you. It, it may not be X itself, but, but the pearl. Yeah, the pearl is going to be well worth it. Yeah. I think that makes more sense as a way to read him, even though I grant it that, that that's a problem. Um, so you would reject the idea that um, the night of infinite resignation... Uh, which now the reason I'm asking is because this is the way our group defined it this morning. Um, we sort of kind of came up with to the conclusion that the night of infant resignation was not um, didn't have God in his purview um, was had come to some place in his life where he had given up on sort of the immediacy and the sensuous and the aesthetic um, and was recognizing that that was empty in and of itself, but more in a sort of a, a Gnostic way or something that we just, that, but was yet to actually even consider God. Would you reject that? That's what the category that the Night of Inf- Infinite Resonation was in? Well, I, I think that's certainly a plausible reading. And I, I mean, I, I, I reject sounds too too violent. I, I, I'm not, <laughs> I don't know if I reject it. Yeah, <laughs> but but I that's not where I landed. Um, what I think Kierkegaard is describing, I think what Kierkegaard is describing is the struggle he had in giving up Regina, and uh, although I think ultimately he, he, I assume he made it to faith. He's describing uh, the stage that he passed through, which was the night of infinite resignation, where he, he, he didn't have the kind of hope that, was, that faith supplies that allowed him to do it gracefully. And so like the ungraceful dancer, he, he, he just couldn't do it gracefully and he couldn't return to earth and just live his life 
he he wore his tragic life on his sleeve. Uh, um, but I but I think in describing that he really is thinking in terms of God, and he gave her up for God. It was an infinite resignation of what of that which God had required him to give up on. So I'm inclined to think that it's it, that it really is focused on his relationship with his creator. But he still doesn't have faith. Um, Some have said that you actually look like Soren Kierkegaard. I've heard that, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, at lunchtime. Well, um, I, I ended up, this really was a bit of a guess at a first reading through this, but what you're saying didn't make sense to me in what I read in the section about the problem of the, the temporary, the teleologic, teleological suspension of the ethical. I, I drew a parallel between the first part of the section of the night of infinite resignation and the night of faith to the examples given in the problem section, which was there are a number of Greek heroes um, that are right. named in contrast to Abraham, that Abraham was the one who actually made the suspension of the ethical. The others were considered heroes by their world, a Greek world, which I consider, even in the name of myths and gods, is relatively earthbound compared to what's truly infinite. Right. So what doesn't make sense to me about what you're saying is, well, the other thing I dialed in was my suspicion that Kierkegaard is, is actually writing this about himself, that he is, and what he is trying to tear down is what I call the romantic hero. Um, I think what's unique about him, of course, is that he has the status of genius in his society. He was loved for it and rejected for it. All these things that are typical to other examples I've read in similar period literature about the romantic hero. And am I right? Does, does that actually come after this period? We start, it kind of is the response to this, or are they living in this time? I think he's right smack dab in the middle of it. Okay. So what I was guessing was actually, first of all, that the night of infinite resignation is like more like the romantic hero. This is... And, and this would have to make infinite resignation mean something different than what you've said, and maybe it doesn't matter. But the fatal flaw in it that I was suggesting that Kierkegaard was seeing in him and that I see in me is the temptation. There's this concept of temptation that's in there too. To hold on desperately and um, with great rebellion in the end, to the status of the romantic hero, one who is rejected by his society, one who stands apart from it and basically goes to their grave thinking, my justice is that 200 years from now someone will realize that I was right and they were all wrong. That kind of figure. Mm -hmm. What's my vested interest in this is that if I'm right, then he's actually saying that the step between the one of infinite resignation and faith is still that issue of pride, that a pride in resigning, I think, and with, in some sense, great bitterness and a sense of my only dignity is knowing that I'm the only one who's right. And if that's true, I think that person could totally be aware of God and all that, but the, the evil weed that's down in there mm -hmm. is that pride that either I am the hero or that I'm the anti-hero. Mm -hmm. And... And holding on to that more dearly than bending the knee, essentially, in my heart, inwardly, to God. So that's where I wouldn't know. I guess the other thing that confuses me is why would Kierkegaard use these metaphors between an infinite resignation night, by the way, too, a night of that, right. and the night of faith, if he's not drawing a more significant distinction or he's drawing a subtle distinction that makes a big that's that's truly a big one it sounds like what you're saying is they're they're actually right next door neighbors and i thought the whole point of you know writing it under the pseudonym and stuff is saying well i can look right over across the jordan and see the promised land but ultimately i i you know the ditch is big I, i'm not going 
I, I can't make the leap and I'm not going to. Well, that's what I'm saying, is that it, I think it's a subtle difference, but it's a huge one. It's the difference between life and death, eternal life and eternal condemnation. So, I, well, I why isn't that huge... just the ethical man, the highest form of the ethical man? Why is it, you say? Why isn't it? I, I thought the step from ethical to religious is a step of faith, period. Oh, oh I see. Well, yeah, I, I don't... I, those are really two different categories. I mean, it's Larry's question that brought them together. And probably a better answer would have been, don't bring them together. They're just two different, two different categories. So to bring them together, does that make, does that make Kat, uh, Kierkegaard's model too much like a system? Do I want to do that? Because suddenly it, well, it, I sure love yeah. how it seems to explain a lot of my experience, but... Well, I, that's not why I said that. I, I mean, what I meant by that is, you know, oftentimes it, you have a model over here that is helpful in describing this part. You have another model over here that's helpful in describing this part. You know, we crave the coherence to bring the models together, but you can't always do that. Sometimes you just need to let them sit there and be helpful, as helpful as they are for describing what they describe, and you may not be able to, to see the coherence in it. Kierkegaard maybe could have brought some coherence to it, but he didn't. He's writing in two different works. This is his model in this work, and this is what he's talking about in this work. And for us to bring them together is somewhat artificial because he didn't, he didn't bring them together. Okay. That's what I mean. Okay. I've got one other question, and is that if the uh, religious subsumes the ethical, does the ethical subsume the aesthetic? No. No. In fact, I think he explicitly says otherwise. That's what either or is. There's a disjunction between the aesthetic and the ethical. You have to make up your mind, either the aesthetic or the ethical. But you can't, you can't get from one to the other. Yeah, the aesthetic, um, you can get bored with the aesthetic and therefore choose the ethical. But the, eth the aesthetic in and of itself is not, is not nurturing the ethical in and of itself. Well, what I meant by that was like Paul's teaching that everything is permissible for me, but not everything is good for me or something. That Basically, I'm trying to say that one of the church cultures, you know, a big church culture reaction to immorality is to shun sensuous pleasure at all and be cut off from that and call that being a Christian. And overall, it feels like, no, there needs to be a place for the oh, senses. Okay. Well, in that sense, Kierkegaard... In that, in fear and trembling, notice how insistent he is that the um, religious not only incorporates the ethical, but incorporates the aesthetic. So it does incorporate it. Yeah, because, uh, well, it incorporates the aesthetic. It doesn't incorporate the aesthetic way of life, but it does incorporate the aesthetic. Because the knight of faith is able to go to the pub and have a, pipe, a pint and a pipe and some conversation with with his buddies, with the best of the aesthetic people living the aesthetic way of life. That, that, that he's free to do that. I think that's the image of the dancer coming back down to the ground and, and not stumbling in, in assuming the posture. I think that's the same thing, is that he can enjoy the, the sensuous things of this life having, having abandoned all of them. Having renounced all of them, he can now enjoy them. They're not, they don't define his life. And precisely because they don't define his life, he can enjoy them. One, one more. So I haven't been here all week. This might be a review, so let me know. Okay. There seems to be three steps in Kierkegaard's work. One or three that we've been talking about at least. One is the night of infinite resignation, one is the night of faith, and one is the night of inwardness. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the night of faith and inwardness are just when we would consider that person as having become a believer. I th the think so. Is that, yeah. The distinction is, so we have, have you already covered this? Uh, no. The distinction is really uncomfortable to me. Between... That, that there would be such a, a separate file for each of those. Oh. It seems like in 
real life, there's an overlap all the time. And, and it's not um, linear, but more um, like sound waves, like coming, yeah, very dynamic. And so it's like someone saying the grief process starts with, you know, this one place and ends at this one place. And that's not how grief works. It's, there's, there's a lot of overlap and coming back and forth. Um, I think that that could be a really, his distinctions could be very disturbing or difficult because my experience is sometimes I have an amazing sense of inwardness. And then the next day, I won't have resigned to something. And, and so I think I'd like you to speak to that. Okay. Um, well, but, yeah. But it's no different than the, than the issue we face in the New Testament. Um, if you are my disciple, um, you will obey my instructions. Well, what does that look like exactly? Um, in fact, in our lives, we go in and out of obeying his instructions. So the way I think I described it in one of the discussion groups is the way I like to think of it is that if this is the narrow way, it's not like any of us go straight down the middle of the narrow way. We are always wandering off of these side, side paths that aren't at all going to the narrow way. But somehow, if we are a true child of God, there's this gyroscope in us that always makes us get back to that path. So my actual path is winding all over the place, but my actual path is controlled by that narrow way that is a commitment to the kingdom of God. Um, so it, it's not illegitimate, I think, for the, for the apostles to say, if you are my child, if you are born of God, you will love other people who are born of God. And yet we find in our experience times where we don't love other people who are born of God at all. You know, they, they just frankly annoy us. And we, we really do battle with that issue. But there's something in us that's committed that so believes that that's right that we end up resolving our hearts into, yeah, I, I can love the reality of what God is doing in them as much as they annoy me. Or, or take any other of the commandments. I mean, that's just one example. But um, mercy if you show no mercy, no mercy will be shown to you. I mean, that's pretty black and white on the one hand. But on the other hand, what does it look like for me to show mercy to others? Well, it, it looks like me really wrestling with whether I'm going to show mercy to others for a long period of my time, of my life. But if I'm a child of God, in the end, that impulse to be like my father and resolve it that I'm going to be merciful to them wins out. That's, that's what... That's what <coughs> indicates that I am a child of God, is that that's what wins out. So when, when you have the Bible or Kierkegaard, I think, speaking in sort of black and white terms, it's not because they're ignoring the fact or wanting to rule out the fact that this is a messy journey and a messy process. It's just that they're wanting us to be, to be clear about certain categories and stances and orientations and perspectives on things, that this perspective is consistent with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, this one is not. Just because we find ourselves in this standpoint in and of itself doesn't mean we're not a child of God, but we're not being consistent with everything that I'm committed to. So that's what's black and white. The standpoints are clear. Our wandering pathway back and forth and around them and through them is a whole other story.